Australians. The first penal settlements in Australia were in Sydney and near Hobart in Tasmania. The convict's new home was strange and exotic. Like the first settlers in America, they borrowed words from the native Aborigines to describe things they'd never seen before, like the Kulaba tree and the boomerang, Billabong, a water hole, and Corroboree, a gathering and place names like Wagga Wagga, Woolamaloo, and Woomera. The convicts also adopted Aborigine words like kangaroo, wallaby, bandicoot, budgerigar, wombat, koala, and dingo. Convicts and Aborigines meeting for the first time communicated in pidgin English. The Australianism walkabout is an early example of pidgin English down under. Among the convicts, the first visitors to Australia noticed the dominating tones of London English. Australian linguist Professor John Bernard. The uh, greatest number came from London and the counties immediately around London, so that naturally there's a big influence into Australian English from London forms of speech. This is most evident in the pronunciation. Uh, you have the broad A sound, which probably belongs in both dialects, and you do have some words and some uh, word patterns, like rhyming slang. The first Australians invented their own rhyming slang ducks and geese for police, and to Captain Cook for a look. Manifestos of the first fleets show that the convicts came from every county of England and Scotland and Ireland, and so many of the words which Australians think are Australian are in fact uh, county words from uh, Great Britain, words like cobber and wowser. Wowser, meaning a killjoy, came from the rural north. Cobber, meaning a friend, came from Suffolk. Larrikin, a youth from Warwickshire. Billy, as in Billy Can, from Scotland. And Barracking, rowdy encouragement, and a corker, a very good thing, from Ireland. The bulk of the uh, early Europeans in Australia were, of course, convicts. And they brought with them the so-called flash language, which was a highly developed jargon which the criminal classes used, and which I suppose the people who weren't quite criminal but had been convicted learnt on the ships. And the consequence was that there was an early complaint from the magistrates that they couldn't understand what was being said in their own courts. And Flash Jim Vaux, who managed to get himself transported three times, uh, in 1812 wrote a short vocabulary of the flash language ostensibly to help the magistrates. Yeah. With their ticket of leave, released convicts joined the pioneering free immigrants, drovers, stockmen and graziers, in the bush or the outback. With them went flash talk, words like swag and swagman. There once was a swagman camped by a billabong Under the shade of a coolabar tree And he sang as he watched his old billy boiling Who'll come a waltz and Matilda with me? Waltz and Matilda, Matilda, me darling Who'll come a waltz and Matilda with me? Waltzing Matilda, leading a water bag Who'll come a waltzing Matilda with me? The first squatters established huge sheep farms known as stations. Here, words like jumbuck for a sheep and tucker for food soon gave a distinctive flavor to Australian English. Hers is that jumbuck you've got in your tucker bag. You better come a waltzing Matilda with me. Steady up, steady up, steady! Hello. Behind. Behind. Waltzing Matilda and leading a water bag. Come a waltzing Matilda with me. Over. Get out. Get out of here. Get out of here. 
Get out of here. George Hawker's ancestors were army officers who settled in Bungaree, north of Adelaide. Like the majority of Australian settlers, they came out as free colonists, but they quickly picked up the convicts' Australian vocabulary and accent. There was no convicts here and no convict labour, so all the settlers here were free. They originally camped about four miles to the east of here on what we call the Hutt River. Um, the water there is brackish, so he cast around looking for fresh water and permanent water, which is what he found here. And he actually came and pitched camp here Christmas Day 1841. It was there to be taken, and they squatted on it. Well, in the 1880s, they were running 100,000 sheep. In Australia, unlike England or America, from Perth to Sydney, there is roughly speaking only one kind of accent. In fact, Australian is the most classless form of English in the world. Part Cockney, part Irish, part Standard English. It has a proud and egalitarian toughness. What's more, judged by speech alone, workers and bosses, sheep shearers and property owners are all virtually indistinguishable. The reputation of shearers is probably hard working, hard drinking, hard playing types. Well, shearers work for four two-hour runs a day, like we work for two hours. Then you stop for a smoker, which is what you'd call a half-hour lunch break. It pays all right. It all depends how fast you are. If you like um, Neville here, that can wind them out. It pays very well, but, you know. Uh, biggest place I do is down the southeast at um, Kukatonga. They shear about 20,000 sheep. There's five of us, and it takes about a month to do them. I find it quite easy. It's but um, when you see a learner, she, you know, you think, gee, I could never go through that again. Blokes like us others who um, part-time shoes, it takes us probably about uh, a week or a fortnight to get ourselves physically fit so that we can shear through without sort of feeling a bit buggered at the end of the day. Gives you hell when you first start off. <laughs> Usually aches right through my run, but, and then you start again the next year and it's the same thing. Today, some 90% of all Australians speak with unashamed Australian accents. But there's still an echo from colonial days. A minority, like George Hawker's aunt, Joan, still speak what's known as cultivated Australian. This is the closest to the standard middle-class speech of England. My parents used to correct us as children. They would tell us if our vowels were incorrect. And I think I had passed that on to my children. I'm not finding it so easy to pass it on to the grandchildren. They are very much more Australian than I think we would like them to be. They seem to do, pick that up when they go to school. They pick up the, the, the very ugly Australian accent. But as I say, if they're picked at enough, they may change. Well, I suppose it's my generation. I've been taught that, that that's not the way you should talk, that you should try and keep your vowels, um, well, much better, much more English than, than that rather harsh, unpleasant sound that is to my ears, and I think to a lot of my generation. Australian English evolved in the outback. But today, 80% of Australians live in the big cities, and the biggest is Sydney. Sydney. 